So tonight, the title of the talk is Long COVID Does Not Exist. And what I'm going to try and do is explain why and what we can do about it. And so the outline is essentially to explain the concept of prolonged symptoms after infection. I'm going to explain to you, for those who don't know, where the origin of the term came from, long COVID, and why the term long COVID I find is unhelpful and possibly harmful. And what I believe is that we should take a system based approach with a shift in focus. Everyone's pretty familiar with COVID now. The first case uh, came to Australia on the 25th of January in 2020. And it was actually a return traveler from China and they looked after at Monash Medical Center here, here in Melbourne, which is the hospital that I'm associated with. Since then, we've experienced a time in our lives like no other. We've had to wear masks or at times we've been dis disallowed entry to places. Those with children or grandchildren remember skate parks that were closed, playgrounds were closed. We were not allowed to visit family in hospital, which made for a really tough time for a lot of people. This has resulted in poor mood for a lot of patients, a lot of people, social isolation, fear, homeschooling, sending parents like us crazy, Having to, and, and to kids having to miss out on school and all the benefits that come from the social interaction that they get from going to school. So on the 15th of March of 2020, I invented the Corona Stick. I thought this was rather ingenious. And this video, which you can take the, the link to, has been watched by, by many people. I'm sure that a lot of people out there have probably seen it before. Uh, initially, this was designed to help with social distancing. And here it is in use. This is me just using the Corona stick just to keep my distance from a few little hooligans that were coming into my office that night. However, despite the Corona stick, there have now been over 11 million cases of COVID just in Australia. But over the last two years, there's also been a lot of fear instilled into people about getting long COVID. And we've seen this through the media. And we've seen this everywhere from on the TV, in the newspapers, a new report warning long COVID could be a mass disabling event. No man's land. Long COVID knocks young workers out of the job market and once again referring to a mass disabling event affecting the economy. And we're all vulnerable. One in 10 people will end up with long COVID, a study suggests. And we've failed Australians already with chronic fatigue. Will we do the same with long COVID? And this person was petrified that the isolation rules would be ceased because of the fear of long COVID. And it is a mystery, long COVID is a mystery, but more, sc more scaring people, of one in three people will catch the virus, will, never, will not recover or have long-term side effects. So where did all of this long COVID come from? It actually came from a Facebook group. This was the Facebook group that was set up in early 2020 for those people who had prolonged symptoms after having COVID infection. And it was for those people who had COVID prior to the 4th of January, 2020. This is before COVID even arrived in Australia. And it was set up to support those that were still suffering, but felt forgotten about where the rest of the world was more concentrated and worried about preventing new infection and uh, preventing the spread of infection. So it was a support group for those who likened their journey to a long haul flight. And for that reason, it was initially called long haulers. So the patients with COVID that became long haulers. There are a few other support groups that set up after that, and some of these have got up to over 100,000 members. Long COVID even has its own page in Up To Date. Up To Date is an online medical textbook, which we all use as specialists, because uh, it's updated regularly with latest medical research and evidence. However, there's no page for long upper respiratory tract infection. There's also no page for long influenza or long flu. We know about glandular fever. Everyone will have heard of glandular fever, sometimes known as mono in America and some of the uh, teenage kids shows because it's known as the kissing disease. We've known forever that approximately 10% of individuals who get the kissing disease have persistent fatigue for six months after their initial viral infection. So it's not just COVID, there is also long flu and pneumonia. 
latest evidence from a scientific and medical point of view comes from this paper presented uh, in Nature, which is one of the most reputable medical journals in the world. And this was published just earlier this year in January. What this article did is it looked at all of the research articles that had been done for the last three years that looked at long COVID. And what it found was that there was no accepted clinical diagnostic criteria for long COVID. The true prevalence is unknown, which means we don't really know how commonly it occurs. The etiology is unknown, so we don't know what the cause is. The symptoms are not defined across the different studies. So some studies defined long COVID as having certain symptoms, other studies defined it as having something else. So there's no consensus about what symptoms constitute the idea of long COVID. And most disappointingly, treatment options are insufficient. So if we can't diagnose it, we don't know how common it is, we don't know what causes it, we don't really know what the symptoms are, and we have no treatment for it, then what is it? I think it's the too hard basket. I think it's a cop out. I think labeling complicated, unexplained symptoms that someone may be experiencing that's affecting how they feel and their quality of life by labeling that long COVID leads to feeling, people feeling helpless and alone because there's nothing we can do to help. And that feeling of being helpless and alone contributes to the problem in the first place. And the fear of being unwell contributes to the symptoms. I'm sure that there are people here tonight that have probably experienced symptoms or felt unwell for a prolonged period of time after COVID infection. If you haven't, then you probably know somebody who has. So I'm certainly not denying for a second that this does not happen. People do get prolonged symptoms after COVID infection. Not everybody, but it does happen. However, long COVID as a diagnosis, I think is not helpful and can actually be harmful. It's not a new concept. We've known that symptoms can continue for a long period of time after infection. So it does not, we do not need the label long COVID. And as we've heard, the treatment guidelines are unhelpful. So I think that we should not stop labeling people as having long COVID. We should take them out of the too hard basket and we should look at the symptoms that they have and what's affecting them and their life and address them to help them feel better. We also need to acknowledge that there are lots of contributing factors. We've been through a difficult time over the last few years where although COVID may have contributed to the symptoms, there may be lots of other contributing factors that maybe not have been so evident in previous years. We've been through terrible lockdowns, especially in Melbourne. There's been a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety and depression and mental health conditions are really prevalent at the moment. A lot of people have been very inactive, much, more, much less active than they had been previously. There's been fear campaigns throughout the media that's instilled fear into a lot of people, fear for going out, fear for being in crowds, fear for of social interactions and social isolation. People are deconditioned and people have side effects from medications and other, um, other health problems that they may have, let alone the possibility that people could have side effects from vaccines. So what are the commonly reported symptoms that do occur sometimes in people after COVID? So the most common ones are shortness of breath, chest pain, cough and fatigue and brain fog. And so I'm gonna address each of them individually and suggest what I think that we can do about them. So shortness of breath. Occasionally, COVID can affect the lungs. However, this is actually very rare now. It was much more common during the initial wave of COVID with the Delta strain, but with Omicron, it's actually quite uncommon. And here we have on the right, a chest X-ray, which is completely normal, and a chest X-ray that shows a lot of white fluffiness throughout the lungs, and that is consistent with somebody who has COVID, which is actually affecting their lungs. So if someone who does have shortness of breath after COVID, the first thing to do is to make sure that in fact, it is not affecting their lungs and there's not an underlying lung problem. And so getting a chest X-ray to ensure that the lungs look normal is important. It's also important to do pulmonary function testing or lung function testing, uh, which we can do uh, in, in our practice where we get patients to blow into a machine and we check how well their lungs function. And here's a lung function test, which is normal. 
And so if we have somebody with a normal chest x-ray and a normal lung function test, for a lot of the time, we can, we can safely assume that it's not a lung problem causing the shortness of breath. Here's an example of some of the numbers have gone red. The transfer factor is reduced. And what this means is that there's a, a problem with the lung getting oxygen from the air into the blood. And that suggests that there is an underlying lung problem. So in the, if this was the case, then we need to look for what that underlying lung problem is that could be causing the shortness of breath. And here's another example where the spirometry is abnormal. And this means that the person has a problem with their airways. And so they may have asthma or COPD, which has been made worse or made evident by the viral infection. And of course, the heart. And a lot of heart conditions can cause shortness of breath. So we need to make sure that if someone has shortness of breath, that's not due to an underlying heart disorder. Once we've excluded underlying medical conditions, which are, I find the most common cause for shortness of breath in these people is actually dysfunctional breathing. This is a change in the pattern of breathing rather than a problem with the lungs itself. And so like this person in the picture is doing, what happens is that people, when they feel breathless, tend to pull air in from the top of the chest rather than breathing from the diaphragm. And if we do that, it's not only inefficient, it, it tires people out and it makes them feel breathless. And when people feel breathless, they're more likely to pull the air in from the top of the chest and then they breathe quicker. And when they breathe quicker, there's less time to get the air in and the time to get the air out. And if that happens for a while, people tend to take the next breath in before they've had the chance to fully breathe out. And if that happens a few times in a row, then the lung fills up with air. And it's called dynamic hyperinflation. If the lung fills up with air, it gets very uncomfortable and very hard to breathe. So people can feel very breathless when their pattern of breathing changes, even though there's no problem with their lung. And so what we should be doing is breathing from the diaphragm. And the good thing about it is that we can correct this. And it's actually a very helpful, useful thing for everybody to do. And so you should uh, take down that QR code because that will take you to a handout, which I use to explain how to do diaphragmatic breathing exercises. If you don't take the QR code down, if you just take that uh, shortened URL, that will take you to the same handout. So you can just type in lungsleep.co forward slash DB for diaphragmatic breathing, and that will take you to the same handout. And so the idea, as the little man in the picture is doing, is while lying on the back, which supports the neck and the shoulders, we take slow, deep breaths in and out with one hand on the chest, one hand on the tummy. And as we breathe in, we want to push our tummy out. And what that does is it engages the diaphragm so that as we breathe from the diaphragm, our diaphragm comes down and pushes our tummy out. So I'd encourage you to get that hand out and have a practice with it. Whether you have had problems with shortness of breath or not, it's, it's a useful exercise to do. The other thing that's very useful is exercise. And sometimes uh, the shortness of breath can be contributed to by inactivity, deconditioning, sometimes weight gain could contribute, and certainly getting out and exercising is very helpful for our breathing. And we've done videos about this in the past, and some of you may have been to our recent talk by uh, Sean Yeo and Leah, who uh, we met earlier, who spoke a lot about breathing exercises and problems with, with breathing and what to do to identify whether you are breathing properly or not, and if you identify that you're not breathing properly, what you can do about it. And there are some other breathing exercises within that video. So you should check it out. So next one is chest pain. The first thing we need to do once again is to exclude a serious underlying medical cause for chest pain. And the one we're most concerned about is ischemic heart disease or heart attack. And I've got colleagues who are cardiologists who have been telling me that there is quite a few people at the moment who have had chest pain and ignored it because they've been told or they think it was due to their COVID or long COVID. And this is really problematic because they're ignoring the fact that they could potentially be having a heart attack. And so people are missing heart attack and angina because they're putting it down to long COVID. From a lung point of view, there's also a possibility that there could be a, lung, a blood clot that goes to the lung, which is a pulmonary embolus. And this can occur after any infection. And it's very important to make sure there's not something serious going on 
uh, to explain the chest pain or the shortness of breath. Some cardiac complications are thought to be more common post-COVID. And here's a paper looking at a lot of patients with heart problems after COVID, suggesting that due to the increase in inflammatory response, it could precipitate some cardiac uh, disease. However, the studies are not really all that clear. And there's a bit of controversy around whether there is a true increase uh, in cardiac complications after having COVID infection, but it may well be the case. The chest pain can also be contributed to by the dysfunctional breathing. And so as I was explaining before, if somebody is breathing in a dysfunctional manner and they're filling their chest up with air, it causes them to feel a lot of tightness across the chest, but also engaging the accessory muscles of breathing, which are the muscles between the ribs, down the neck, across the shoulders, to breathe rather than the diaphragm causes these muscles to get sore. And so sometimes these patients get pain across the neck and shoulders, but they also can get a lot of chest pain. But the diaphragmatic breathing exercises, once again, can settle down this chest pain. So once an underlying serious medical cause has been excluded for chest pain, then often people get better with simple breathing exercises. Cough. Once again, we need to exclude underlying possible medical, possible medical causes for the cause of the cough. And the common ones would be asthma or other underlying lung disease. And sometimes people can get a secondary bacterial infection. So certainly if people are coughing and coughing up phlegm, then it could suggest that there is an underlying uh, or secondary bacterial infection that requires treatment. Once those things have been excluded though, I think a really common cause for the cough in patients after a virus, and it doesn't matter whether this is COVID or influenza or RSV, common cause for it is irritation to the larynx or the vocal cords due to the virus causing ongoing cough. And that irritation can be made worse by mucus from the upper airway dripping down and dripping down the back of the throat. And that can co contribute to this ongoing cough, even if there's no underlying lung problem. And what I find really effective in this situation is the simple old FES nasal spray. And this is just a saline solution that I suggest to a lot of people and a lot of people get good benefit from. It has no side effects, it's cheap. I have two sprays, both sides. Uh, twice a day, and it can help settle down that cough that can persist after a viral infection. Another quite disabling symptom that some people are experiencing after COVID is fatigue and brain fog. And fatigue and brain fog sort of go together because they, we believe that they probably have a similar underlying cause and the symptoms are relatively overlap. Uh, essentially, it's the feeling of being sluggish, fuzzy, not sharp, tired, and no lack of energy. Anyone could have probably experienced this in the past. Say, for instance, if you were jet lagged or if you were sleep deprived, you'd feel uh, fatigued. And with fatigue can come some brain fog. It may, be that, it may signify that there is an underlying problem, such as sleep apnea. So if somebody snores, then it may be that they've got underlying sleep apnea causing poor quality sleep and the virus has precipitated that. And so investigating for an underlying sleep disorder can be important because that could be treated and to improve the symptoms. Medication side effects often cause sleepiness, brain fog and, and affects concentration, causes fatigue. Uh, diabetes, as well as lots of any other sort of chronic medical condition can cause these symptoms as well as lifestyle. There's been quite a few studies looking into this to try and work out what's causing it. And the theory, or the theory that has not been necessarily proven is that it could be due to mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondria are the things in your cells that create energy, um, or it could be due to altered fatty acid metabolism. The other theory is that it could be due to inflammation of the nerves and the blood vessels, but we're not really sure. There is a suggestion that a low dose of naltrexone, which is, which is a drug, can be helpful for neuroinflammation. However, this has only been studied in patients with chronic fatigue, and it's only been a few small studies to suggest its use, and it certainly has not been tested in COVID. But it was suggested in that paper in, in Nature that I showed you earlier as something that could be tried. I don't think that the evidence for this is good enough 
at the moment to recommend this to people. There was also a study to suggest that exercise can worsen the symptoms of fatigue. However, if you look at that study, that was a survey of people, 90% of whom were female, and the, the survey was taken from people on social media. I don't really think that a survey of people on social media is really going to be an unbiased representation of the effect of exercise. Since then, there has been multiple studies to show the benefits of exercise in the treatment of fatigue and brain fog after COVID. So I think that we can be confident that exercise is beneficial. Getting adequate amounts of sleep is going to be very important. We need to address the contributing factors of anxiety and depression and optimal nutrition can also help improve the brain fog and also the fatigue. So if we look at the symptoms, the shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, fatigue and brain fog, I think that we can make significant improvements to all of these symptoms and most of them come down to pretty simple lifestyle type measures. What I'd like to do now is explain to you two theories of medicine, which help understand the background to where I believe our approach to healthcare in general has got lost and gone in the wrong direction. This is Louis Pasteur, a Frenchman, who in the 1850s came up with germ theory. Germ theory says that germs, such as microorganisms, bacteria, or viruses, invade the human host, reproduce within the human, and cause disease. So the answer is to kill the germ or prevent the germ from getting in in the first place. This theory has now been implied to most of modern medicine, including diseases of lifestyle, which I feel is a shame, such as atherosclerosis or hardening of the blood vessels that causes heart disease and stroke. In an atherosclerotic sclerotic blood vessel, we see cholesterol buildup. So cholesterol has become a therapeutic target to pharmaceutical companies, hence the emergence of statins, cholesterol-lowering drugs. But the problem is not the cholesterol. The cholesterol is just there to help repair the blood vessel. The underlying problem is probably the inflammation and the production of blood clot. So worrying about cholesterol levels is not addressing the underlying problem that's causing the disease in the first place. And that where I think where germ theory fails us. This is Antoine Bechamp, who is also a Frenchman, around the same time came up with terrain theory. This puts the emphasis on maintaining a state of wellness and internal balance to starve off disease. Once the terrain is compromised, it gives the disease causing pathogens a chance to get in and proliferate, which leads to disease. So this theory concentrates on improving the overall health of the body to fight the disease rather than just trying to concentrate on killing the pathogen or the germ. The terrain also includes the microbiome of the gut. And we know that good nutrition can positively influence the gut bacteria, and this leads to improved immunity and our own ability to deal with germs and diseases that might affect us. So Antoine and Louis debated their theories for many years. And interestingly, Louis Pasteur was known to say uh, prior to his death that, is not, that it is not the germs we need to worry about, it is our inner terrain. However, unfortunately, germ theory remains the predominant theory today. And I think this is problematic. And maybe the health of our population may be better off if we concentrated more on terrain theory. So how do we improve your inner terrain? And I believe that it's a combination of concentrating on healthy nutrition, exercise, sleep, and mental health. From a nutritional point of view, I think that it is proven uh, well and truly that the most healthy way that we can live our life is eating a diet that is very low in carbohydrate with avoidance of processed foods. And I've done uh, previous talks on this that are on our YouTube channel, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen them, to uh, download this most recent one, which explains the reasons behind that and how to actually adopt that nutritional lifestyle into your life. And I um, can guarantee that you'll have good benefits with that. And I just love when I see patients in the rooms and, and I recommend this to them, sometimes their eyes open up and they just can't believe it when I tell them that they should have bacon and eggs for breakfast. And then they go away and do that and they, and they come back reporting that not only do they feel better, 
but they lose weight, sometimes come off their medications. We need to make sure that we get adequate amounts of sleep and we need to make sure that we get good quality sleep. And once again, we've also done, done talks about this as this is obviously our area of specialty. Um, and so I encourage you to have a look at uh, this talk, especially if you have any issues with sleep or want to look for uh, some ideas as to how you can improve your own sleep. And in this talk, I look at four factors that I think are the most important things to address when trying to improve or optimize sleep. Exercise is really important. Exercise doesn't necessarily achieve weight loss, but it has lots and lots of health benefits. And it doesn't really matter what sort of exercise you do. Probably the best exercise is some sort of combination of aerobic, walking, running, getting shorter breath, uh, and also some resistance training. But probably the best thing is to do what you like to do, what you're able to do, because certainly any activity is going to be beneficial. And the last of the four pillars of, uh, of overall health is mental health. And over the last few years, we've been through, as I said, a really difficult time. And there are a lot of people who are struggling with mental health. And so you certainly shouldn't be feeling bad about that. If you think back to what we've been through, it's been very difficult. It's been difficult for lots of different reasons. But it's important to work hard on your mental health. And I really like Hugh Van Kylenberg from the Resilience Project that talks about achieving happiness through gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness. He talks about uh, being aware of things that you're grateful for, listing things that you're grateful for, talking about things that you're grateful for, showing empathy to others, uh, doing nice things to other people, helps you feel better in yourself, and practicing mindfulness. And practicing mindfulness is really useful in helping settle down anxiety, improving mental health. And just doing those breathing exercises that I was talking about before is actually a really good way to practice mindfulness. So just by going to that handout that I gave you that hopefully you're able to take down, just practicing that for five or 10 minutes is useful mindfulness. Otherwise, there are lots of apps that you can get. And this is one that I recommend often called Insight Timer that you can get. And there's a free program which, which will just take you through mindfulness exercises. So I believe we need to shift our focus from disease to health. I think we need to stop focusing on these diseases and focus on good health, your terrain. Get your terrain in order, and that will give you the best opportunity for all of everything else from a health point of view to fall into place. We should be co concentrating on nutrition, exercise, sleep, and improving our mental health. And so rather than concentrating on this list of diseases, if we shift our focus, I think that we will all, and, and from a community point of view, be better off. So in summary, everybody's going to get COVID if you haven't had it already. The majority of you may have already had it. And the good news is that if you get it again, it'll be much less significant illness, it'll be much milder. Some of you, however, will experience symptoms for a long, prolonged period of time after the initial infection. But don't let yourself get put in the too hard basket, resulting in fear and helplessness. Maybe make a corona stick and take up the fight to COVID by taking control and improving your overall health. So we should shift our focus to well-being, making sure that you get an adequate amount of good quality sleep, exercise regularly, concentrate on having a low carbohydrate diet with avoidance of, uh, of processed foods, and take some time out just to practice mindfulness and meditation. And with that, I hope that we can all be healthier.